Hi everyone, welcome back to Dave's Math Channel. I'm your host David Tear, and um, you know, I'm, in my next video, I want to continue with derivatives. I want to start um, coming up with formulas for derivatives of trig functions. I'm going to do that in my next video, but before we do that, we have to first uh, do some stuff with limits, and there's a very important result regarding limits known as the squeeze theorem. Uh, I'm going to illustrate, I'm not going to prove it rigorously, but I'm going to state it and kind of give an intuitive uh, proof um, with quotation marks. And then we're going to use it uh, to find an important limit, um, in particular the limit is x approaches 0 of sine x over x, so that's equal to 1. That's going to be a very important result, which we'll be able to use to come up with formulas for derivatives of all the trig functions, which I said I'll do next. So anyway, let's begin. So uh, here's here's the statement of the squeeze theorem. So uh, we have three functions here, three continuous functions, which are, we're calling g of x, f of x, and h of x. And they're all, all three of these functions are defined on some interval, um, which we call i. And um, um, I guess it doesn't have to be defined at every point on this interval, uh, but it has to be defined at every point except for um, one point where we want to find the limit. Uh, and we're calling that point A. So you can think of it as I as an interval uh, except for a single point in the interval called A, where these functions might not be defined, but they have a well-defined limit at A. So what this theorem is saying, if that's the case, and if we have g of x is less than or equal to f of x and is less than or equal to h of x, for every point x on this interval except for a, um, uh, so the, I think you can see why this is called a squeeze theorem now, because f of x is squeezed between these two other functions, g of x and h of x. Uh, it's in the middle. Sometimes it's called the sandwich theorem, because... If you graph the f g of f g and f of h, you can kind of kind of looks like a sandwich where g, the graphs of g of x and h of x are sort of like the slices of bread, and the graph of f of x is like the slice of whatever's inside the sandwich. So anyway, uh, and so that that's one of our assumptions. The other assumption is that this particular point a in the interval, we have the limit as x approaches a of g of x is equal to the limit as x approaches a of h of x. And we're calling that limit capital L. And if that's the case, then it also turns out that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to L. That should be pretty easy to see. I mean, I think intuitively this is pretty obvious. Because we know that f is sandwiched between g and h. And since g and h have the same limit at this point a, then uh, f doesn't have anywhere to go. It's squeezed from below by L and it's squeezed from above by L. So it has to equal L. It has no other choice. So I think intuitively it makes perfect sense. I'm not going to prove it rigorously because proofs involving limits can be pretty ugly, as you guys have seen. Uh, they usually involve epsilon and delta. And I'd rather not do that today. So anyway, that's the essence of the squeeze theorem and an intuitive proof of it. So, uh, And here's an illustration. So uh, now we have three functions in this graph. The red function is g of x, and that's this upside, that upside down parabola. Uh, and then the uh, h of x would be the right side up parabola. And you can see this function in the middle, the one that's oscillating, that's what we're calling f of x. And it is squeezed between these two parabolas. So if you wanted to compute the limit as uh, x approaches 0 of, all, of f of x, well, I think you can see that g of 0 and h of 0 are both 0. Um, and so, therefore, uh, and the, at the limit as x approaches 0 of, of f of x is also 0. f doesn't even have to be defined at this point. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know what the formula is uh, for this function. I think it's something like um, sine of x squared over x squared. I don't think it is defined at this point, but it has the same limit, namely 0. So, you see how that works. And uh, and now we really want to use this squeeze theorem for a particular problem. So now let's let's first look at the graph on the right. So we want to prove first. We want to ultimately we want to prove this limit. The limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x is equal to one. This is the limit that will allow us to compute the derivatives of all the trig functions. So this is a very important limit. 
So how do we prove this? Well, we use the squeeze theorem to prove it. So again, we have three functions here. Uh, f of g of x, f of x is what we're calling sine x over x. And you can see it's not really defined when x is zero. I mean, I guess you could make it defined, but some people call this function uh, sync, I think, sine x over x. Uh, and some people define its value to equal one. Um, but I mean, just, you know, you can't divide by zero. So technically this function sine x over x is undefined when x equals zero. That's why I want to compute its limit, but uh, and show it's equal to one. But uh, what are our, our g and h? So what are we sandwiching this function between? Well, it turns out we're sandwiching it between cosine x and 1. And what we ultimately want to show here is that um, sine x, of, that these three functions do satisfy the, uh, um, the uh, right um, conditions for, uh, so that we can apply the squeeze theorem to them. In other words, cosine x is less than or equal sine x over x is less than or equal to 1. This is true for the interval i going from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. I mean, this picture, they only really show from 0 to pi over 2. But these functions are all even. That means that uh, if you negate the argument, they're still the same. So it really is true from minus pi over 2, two to pi over 2 as well. Um, so anyway, how do we prove this, uh, these two inequalities? Well, they do it with these three trying, uh, yeah, three trying, well, actually two right triangles and a wedge, or not two right triangles, two, two triangles and a wedge. We got an isosceles triangle, the triangle they're calling uh, AD, um, what is it, B, I guess. Yeah, the triangle ADB, I think you guys can see that's an isosceles triangle. That's a, a sector, or a, you know, it's not a sector, it's just an isosceles triangle embedded in the sector. The sector is the portion of the circle. Uh, that's the thing that's shaded in green. So the area of the sector, I think it's pretty easy to see. The total area of the circle is, is pi r squared, and since the radius of the circle is 1, the total area of the circle is pi. And since there's two pi radians going around, uh, and keep in mind that uh, in calculus, we always use radians for angular measures. It's kind of the natural measure of angles. Uh, so get used to thinking in radians. Don't think in degrees anymore. We're not going to use degrees. Degrees are very inconvenient in calculus. Uh, and we don't even call the angles radians anymore. We just call them numbers. So uh, when we see sine x, we're always assuming x is in radians and similar for the other the other trig functions. So um, anyway, so the area of the sector with an angle of uh, x is just x over 2 because uh, the total area of the circle is pi. Like I said, the total angular me measure going around is 2 pi. So to get an area of a sector, you have to divide by 2. So the area of uh, the green sector is just uh, um, 1 half x or if you like x over 2. Um, and, uh, and, and you can see it's squeezed between the area of the isosceles triangle ADB, which is, um, what is that? Uh, um, you can get that by uh, just the formula for the area of a triangle, 1 half base times height. You can see the base, the way they've shown this, uh, this triangle is 1, and the height is sine x. So its area is 1 half sine x. So, uh, so, uh, and that, and one half sine x has to be less than uh, x over two, because as you can see from this picture, that's true. The uh, isosceles triangle is a proper subset of the uh, wedge, uh, or the sec, the sector. And then similarly, the sector is a proper subset of this bigger right triangle, which has a base of one again, and this time its height is tangent x. So. That means that x over 2 is less than uh, um, 1 half tangent x. And, of course, we can multiply both uh, all three sides of this inequality by 2. We get sine x is less than x is less than tan x, which we can rewrite as sine x over cosine x. Now we can do a little bit of algebra. We can divide everything by cosine x. We get sine x over cosine x is less than, um, um, uh, what is it? 1 over x. Is that right? How'd they get that? Yeah, because we're divided by x. So, yeah. And then and that's less than 1 over um, 
sine x. The, uh, it's cosine x over sine x. Uh, oh, they, they, they took the reciprocal. I don't know what they did here. You know, this is kind of confusing to me. But um, anyway, I guess you just have to follow the algebra. I don't want to try to figure it all out. But in the end, what you'll get if you do all this algebra is you get the inequality we want. Cosine x is less than or equal to sine x over x is less than or equal to 1 whenever x is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. Of course, x can't be 0 because sine x over x isn't defined there, but it's defined everywhere else in this interval. So now, finally, we can use the squeeze theorem to prove that this limit is the case. Because if you look at uh, the other two limits, the limit as x approaches 0 of cosine x, well, that's you don't even have to take a limit. That's just cosine of 0. And we all know that the cosine of 0 is 1. And similarly, the function 1, which is just a constant, that's 1 everywhere. So uh, when you evaluate that 0, you also get 1. So we're sandwiched between 1 and 1. Therefore, by the squeeze theorem, the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is equal to 1. Voila, we're done. So um, anyway, we got the result we want. And like I said earlier, we can use this result to get derivatives of the trig functors, which I will do in the next video. That, that part's easy. We did the hard part of finding this limit. So anyway, that concludes my video on the squeeze theorem and an important application of it. Thank you for watching. Long live math, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.